Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's program. As many of you know, May 16th is yet another election day in the city of L.A., where candidates will be vying for several seats in the runoff elections uh, to the March primaries. Well, the Armenian National Committee of America local chapters have in, uh, endorsed several candidates. Among them is one of my guests this evening, Imelda Padilla, who is running for the LAUSD board in the District 6, I believe. That's correct. Welcome, Imelda. And joining her today is ANCA Sanlan Tahanga member, Astine Suleimanyan, who's going to be talking about some local efforts to make sure people get out the vote. But I'd like to start with you tell us about what made you decide to run for the Glenda, uh, sorry, LAUSD uh, board seat. Well, you know, uh, I actually graduated from LAUSD. I'm the only candidate that did. So I'd like to see myself as an example of what the LAUSD school board can do um, to create uh, success stories like myself. After graduating from all of my local schools, I did you know, go to a, a very good university. I graduated from UC Berkeley, where I studied political science. And I've come back to my community and have always been active working with teachers uh, specifically to help them encourage students to go to college and be competitive when they go to college. Uh, my experience with getting into college was one of, it wasn't just my grades, but a lot of it had to do with the extracurricular activities that I did as a teenager to get into the competitive four year. So I've been that partner for a lot of different teachers in my community. And when the political uh, landscape shifted, you know, and the seat became open, uh, a lot of those teachers that I've been working with, a lot of those administrators uh, said that they, you know, are big fans of the leadership conferences that I've been putting together but they would like for me to now be their advocate on the school board, somebody who understands uh, advocacy, uh, negotiations, um, knows the schools, knows what it's like to be a student in the schools. And, you know, I, I found it flattering to, to have educators in the community reach out to me to take this leap of faith. And I said, why not? So that's why I'm at today. Mm -hmm. uh, proud to say that I have the support of teachers, administrators, the custodians, the cafeteria workers, and everyone who really uh, you know, plays a role or has a stake in mm -hmm. public education. What are some of the issues that are particular to your district that you'd like to uh, address? Well, you know, sometimes I feel that the Northeast San Fernando Valley um, doesn't get its fair share. Um, its fair share of attention, its fair share of funding. Uh, we don't have the reputation of necessarily being the poorest district. And we definitely don't have the reputation for being the richest. We're probably one of the more diverse ones. We have stud uh, students and families from multiple backgrounds. So I want to make sure that we get our fair share of funding, especially now that we have so much money that's going to be trickling in from the uh, propositions that passed in November from Prop 55 to Prop 51 and implementing Prop 58. Um, in addition to that, I, you know, I feel that my educators, my education leaders, don't have an advocate on the school board to help them replicate their best practices. Some of my schools do a much better job at graduation rates. Some do better with discipline. Some do better with college prep. And I really want to be that advocate that helps provide spaces for all of them to talk to each other to replicate those best, those best practices, uh, regardless of the school's governance model. Um, and, and, you know, really get more services uh, that are helping students in more spaces. Mm -hmm. uh, in addition to that, I feel that right now our parents are caught in the middle in the middle of all of the different changes that are happening with education, and we need to work with our parents to really understand these changes because a lot is being uh, is going through the pipeline. You know, they're going to be changing the uh, what they're talking about potentially changing the way parents apply to the magnet schools. Right. There's a lot of different choices now and sometimes parents don't necessarily have access to being able to uh, compare and contrast schools and how do you compare and contrast in a way that's uh, best suited for their children. So there's a lot of work to do um, and a lot of leadership that's needed because right now a lot of our schools are working in silos and that's not good for kids. That's not good for families. We need to talk to each other because we know students jump from one place to another and, you know, sometimes within a family. Uh, every child has different needs. So we have to be able to arm our parents with the tools to be able to um, 
to know what's best for mm -hmm. the um, I'm going to come back to the changes happening in the education system because certainly with the new administration in the White House and the somewhat controversial Secretary of Education, I'm sure that's going to at one point trickle down to the state. But I want to go to Ostine and ask why did the ANCA decide to endorse Imelda Padilla for this race? Um, the Armenian community in Sunland Tahanga is, is, a, is a new active community there. And the Armenian National Community of America has been following the Magnolia Charter uh, Academy, which is part of the Charter School Association. And if most people remember during the Ardi Kasakin campaign, um, the Charter School Association poured in a lot of money to privatize education. Well, the Magnolia. Can we also say that it's part of the Gulen network? That's exactly where I was going next. It's part of the Gulen group where they were taking funding that they were supposed to put into the classroom. They were using those funds at the Magnolia Charter Schools to provide visas to folks in Turkey to come to America. And so part of this is that there's no accountability for the, the charter schools, and we want to make sure that there's regulations, that they're held to the same standards as public edu education uh, schools do. And uh, Imelda Padilla is the public education candidate. Kelly Gonez, the opponent, is being funded by the Charter School Association. They have this week are planning on spending another million dollars in her race. They've already spent two million dollars. And so we are working against the machine and the only way that we can make sure that we have the community voice on the school board is to go out and vote. Okay. And certainly, um, please, uh, again, go and vote on May 16th. if. Uh, you are registered. Your number is on your screen, 818-806-8683. Uh, phone the High Votes offices and they will help you with any uh, questions. Now, let's go back because this is a pattern we're seeing and I'm throwing this out uh, to uh, the two of you. These big money coffers are coming in and uh, beginning to uh, impact certain races of uh, critical importance. Uh, how do you as a candidate uh, approach this issue? Well, you know, this is the first time I'm running for office. Um, this is a very new thing for me and I'm just trying to stay positive and uh, take the high road because it is a lot of money, um, but I don't let it uh, you know, one of the benefits of having a lot of money is that you have the ability to tell a story. And sometimes the opposition tells a story, but it's not true. But I like to think that our voters are more are smarter and more sophisticated, and they can look through all those lies. When you, um, you know, it, it, it is a little overwhelming, um, but you just have to stay positive and you have to do everything in your power as a candidate to be able to fundraise not necessarily the same amount because that's not going to happen. If they have a million dollars, you're not going to be able to raise a million dollars, but you can fundraise enough to stay competitive and you just have to work hard and you work hard and you tell your story and you, again, voters are smart and sophisticated and they will look through it. Mm -hmm. And I'm glad you're telling your story to us today in our <laughs> studio. Uh, but the education system seems to be continuously changing. And it's, uh, I think at the end of the day, the students are, uh, you know, basically taking the brunt of what bureaucrats or others have laid out. First, there were standardized testing and schools were really flocking about uh, on that issue. Now, for example, Betsy DeVos, the education secretary, is uh, talking about the voucher system for private schools, which this state dealt with in the 90s. Uh, so you know, where do you think is the uh, common ground where the student goes into the classroom and is learning rather than uh, going to meet certain requirements so that school gets funding for it? Well, I think whether you're in the business of housing, if you're in, in the business of education, entrepreneurs know that the best contracts to get are public-private, right? Everyone is a fan of public-private partnerships. Um, there is no secret that in California we have a large group of people that are fighting the, um, and even in the country, that are fighting the uh, private prison fight, right? That people should not be making money 
off of people that are imprisoned. And I think that now with it, when it comes to these conversations of vouchers and the public-private partnership of public education, it, that's really what it is, is that you have entrepreneurs who know, well, we're going to keep having children, we're going to keep growing in a population, we're going to continue to have to educate, why not play a role in, um, in, a, in that sort of public-private partnership to make money? I mean, it's no secret that a few, maybe now a year, over a year now, Eli Broad Foundation's uh, report was released where they refer to our children as market share, right? They see them as people who will bring in money and continue to enrich them because it's a service that the U.S. government continues to fund education and they want a piece of that pie. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's just something dangerous that we need to be cognizant of as a society, regardless of what, um, you know, public service we're providing. Mm -hmm. There's always going to be those folks that want to push privatization or some kind of partnership. But mm -hmm. we have to be wary of, you know, does it really serve the intent? And in public education, it really comes down to a case by case basis. We do know that there's some charter schools where you have genuine educators trying to do what's best for children. We have definitely, especially within the last year, year and a half, seen the cases where it really has just been adults trying to enrich themselves. We've had some scandals where, you know, um, CEOs are making close to half a million dollars. Uh, that's where we have to work as policymakers to make sure that those sorts of things don't happen. Mm -hmm. um, these are issues that we're going to talk about after a short break. So please stay with us. We'll be right back. Welcome back, everyone. Ahead of Tuesday, May 16th, uh, elections in the city of L.A., joining me in the studio, if you are just joining us, is uh, Imelda Padilla, who's running for the LAUSD uh, board in District 6, and also our own Asina Suleimanyan of the ANCA Tanlant Sahanga uh, Tanlan Tahanga chapter. Uh, so welcome back. Uh, we, I want to pick up uh, on... Uh, the issues that you brought up uh, regarding uh, privatization, charter schools, and some of the monies that are flowing into these uh, systems that ultimately are impacting and affecting the public school system. Uh, why is the student the victim? Well, the student becomes the victim because we we are never 100% sure if they're receiving the full funding that is owed to them. Um, when we have a situation where it's the beginning of the school year and parents choose a school that they're interested for their child, right? Let's say that happens. We get from the state a certain amount of funding per child. If they started a charter school, um, that's fine. The charter school has its set of funding to run their school program as well. But what we continue to see repeatedly, and every charter is different, um, about a third into the school year, there's this date known as um, D-Day. And after D-Day, if the student is a student that they think is going to maybe affect their um, test scores, they kick the student back into the traditional school. But by then, the traditional school has already lost the per pupil funding that they should have received. And that puts principals in a situation where, you know, maybe they're down a teacher and for those students that come back because they didn't receive the funding in the beginning. It puts the principal and the administration in a position where they didn't have that funding to get that extra librarian or the nurse or the extra support staff and maintenance. All of those things affect the child. Sometimes we think of schools as just things that are happening inside the classroom, but it's also the outside, right? Is do they have a clean campus? Do they have a place to go if they have a headache? Do they have a person to speak with if they're going through some kind of social emotional issue? And also college counselors. When you have an, a fluid budget and principals don't know how many students they're gonna have matching the numbers that they receive in the funds, um, all of that affects the child. Mm -hmm. What's been students. some of the interesting, you said it's your first time you're running. 
What what are some of the interesting things you've experienced on the campaign trail? You know, it's definitely been um, being attacked for things that are volunteerism, right? Um, never in my wildest did I think that my time on the neighborhood council, a space where I learned so much, made great friends, um, was going to be an issue someday when I ever ran. I always thought it would be something of an asset because of everything that I learned and all of the friendships that I made. But that just goes back to the conversation of money. The conversation of money and the big interest in privatizing our education that they've turned something related to attendance into uh, a picture of failure. And I would have never thought that that would happen. So, you know, I learned a lot from that. I realized how thick my skin is from that. <laughs> but I just have to keep moving on, you know, and um, that's, that's definitely uh, something I'm never going to forget. As uh, Austin uh, mentioned earlier in the program, the Armenian community in uh, San Lan Tehanga is somewhat burgeoning. It's a little bit newer than, let's say, Glendale or Los Angeles. Right. Uh, what has your experience been with the community there? So, you know, I've seen that, right? I've, I've been living in the San Fernando Valley, in, nor in the Northeast San Fernando Valley from the day that I was born. I grew up in Sun Valley, so I, I actually live right at the border of Burbank mm -hmm. and Sunland, right in the middle. And I've always, uh, being someone who attends public education, has always, I, I grew up with Armenians, right? I very much see them as, a commun as an immigrant community within my community that has their own uh, set of, uh, of interests, right? And, and a desire to preserve their culture and preserve their, their language. And I knew that if I was going to run for school board, that that they were going to be a very important community because uh, more and more are moving into, into, into the neighborhood. Even within my own block, uh, we've had about five more families move in within the last you know, 10 years. So um, very rich culture, very good people, very good work ethic. And I think that in the work ethic is where um, I identify the most with them coming from a family where my father was a gardener and my mom to this day works, you know, at a manufacturing plant. Uh, it was always in the work ethic where I knew that we've always, uh, we, we connect, even with the people that I grew up with, right? And very strong sense of family and unity. Um, and that desire to preserve your culture was where we identified. And I knew that when, if, when running that I was going to have to reach out because it is growing. It is growing and uh, you stick together. <laughs> um, Austin, tell us about uh, the, I guess, power of the constituency in that area, Armenian constituency in that area. Currently, right now, we have 14,000 Armenians that live in that district that are registered to vote. Um, out of the 14,000 Armenians, um, 7,000 have already received their ballots. Unfortunately, only 1,700 of those folks have turn in their ballots. So we really have to make sure that we turn in those ballots. We want to have an active and loud voice in that, that district. This is the first time that we are going to show our power in uh, Board District 6. And uh, having an active campaign, having the support of the Armenian National Committee is going to get us um, to make sure that we are uh, the, the diminishing factor of this election. Mm -hmm. It is gonna be a small turnout election. Um, as you can see, when you get your ballots in the mail, it's about, it's as thin as can be, and it's different than the original ones that we've had in the past. And so, this is probably gonna be the election where it's gonna be 50 votes. This could be the election where someone could win with 50 votes. Imelda Padilla can win with 50 votes. And we don't wanna sit back and think of what we could have done differently. So it's very important that we're actively engaged and involved in this election. Um, I think it's also a critical point of us starting off that um, conversation in that district. Um, there's, I'm sure, a lot of people in that area um, that didn't even, you know, pro probably didn't even know that there was an election prior to us reaching out and making those phone calls. But we really, 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 really have to, and I want to stress it over and over again, to make sure that we turn in our ballots um, by this Thursday. If you don't turn it in, walk into your polling location on Tuesday and to go out on Tuesday and vote. Um, email the Padilla's number 95 on your ballot. Um, ask your neighbors, get people together. Uh, ANCA will be providing rides, so there are no excuses. If you wanna get your neighbors together, there's a lot of complexes and apartments in that area. If you wanna get your neighbors together for a coffee and then walk over to your polling location, 
Most polling locations are right around the corner in Salin Tahanga at schools or churches. Um, but our engagement is a critical piece uh, because we're not only going to say uh, that we are a, uh, a voice in that area, but it's also a message for us to send to the Magnolia Charters. And the AINC over there is also endorsing uh, Caro Toro San Juan's first city uh, council. So really important in that area, given that it is a fairly new uh, Armenian community there, and uh, the numbers are certainly impressive, mm -hmm. 14,000 registered voters. So if you're out there watching, if you're one of the 14,000, make sure if you have absentee ballot forms, fill them out and send them by t Thursday, uh, and uh, go to the ballots on uh, Tuesday. Any final thoughts before we end the interview? Well, I'm happy to be here. It's always exciting to continue to engage with the Armenian community. And I just wanted to say that, um, you know, it's a growing constituency on the side of town that I'm running in, and I will always have you guys at the table. It is my plan to continue to uh, enhance the culture and preserve the language of the Armenian community, and very much a strong advocate that we need to continue to talk about the atrocities of the Armenian genocide so that we can never repeat that again. Mm -hmm. Thank you and good luck to you on Tuesday. Any final thoughts? Yes, I also wanted to add another candidate. Um, uh, Steve Zimmer is also running for re-election. He's the president of the school board. He has been a friend of the ANC for many years. He has stood at the forefront. He is the one that pushed for investigation for the Magnolia Charters at LAUSD. He's in a different district. He's in the West area, but he's on most of your ballots. He's number 91. Please make sure to vote for him. Again, elections are May 16th. If you have your ballots, send them in. If not, by Thursday, tomorrow, walk them into your polling location. Mm -hmm. And also the ANCA local chapters in Hollywood and San Gabriel Valley have endorsed Bill Cedillo for the District 1 race in the uh, City Council. So uh, actually, it's very important uh, uh, that everyone participates mm -hmm. because this is our local elections. Our politics are local. M vote on May 16th. And thank you for joining us. Good night. My We have the power. The power to take our unified voice from the streets to the ballot box. From the streets to the ballot box, where it matters. There's too much at stake. Affordable housing, green space, and safe neighborhoods. To implementing genocide education in all of our public schools. Expanding Armenian dual immersion programs in our schools. The Armenian cause is in your hands. You have the power. You have the power. Each and every vote, your vote, will make a difference. And out of over 14,000 Armenians registered to vote in these districts, we can do better. We can do better. Your vote will make the difference. Each and every vote will make a difference. The Armenian vote matters. Or on election day, May 16. Whatever you do, whatever you do, just vote. Just vote. And get counted. It's our obligation to our past and to our future. Our collective future. <laughs>